It was quite possible that all personnel were outside looking for me around the Halep's ending transit station. I stared at the elevator. It didn't really look that different from any other. Maybe a little larger door. The problem was the button, or more accurately the sign over the button that said, Authorized Personnel Only. There was a card reader beside the button. I took a totally unnecessary deep breath and pulled out Natasha's card. Moment of truth. I doubted that a failure would result in sirens and flashing red lights, but it would certainly alert someone, and I'd have visitors by and by, and nowhere to run. Before I could fetch any more, I pushed the card against the reader, then pressed the button. The button lit for a moment, and the door opened. Hallelujah, I was in business. I entered the elevator and pressed the top button, since that would be where I'd transfer to another stay. The doors closed and the elevator accelerated upward, and I realized something that I'd failed to notice when I boarded. This elevator had windows. I shouldn't have been surprised. The Quinlans had long since shown that they had a strong visual artistic sense. Naturally, they wouldn't waste the opportunity to display this view. I had 56 miles of vertical travel in which to enjoy it, and, uh, I didn't specifically remember ever having had acrophobia, but I'd never been going literally miles up into the air with a panoramic view before. I had to consciously stop myself from stepping to the back of the elevator. If this got any worse, I might have to activate the endocrine control system. I deliberately stood at the window and observed while trying to control my breathing. The curve of Heaven's River was becoming visible, and we'd already passed at least one cloud layer. The river system, forests, townships, and dots on the water that could be boats all spread out below me in a panorama that exceeded anything I'd seen in a lifetime several hundred subjective years long. I made a point of recording as much as I could and forwarding it to my blog. The trip took 20 minutes total, which was quite impressive. Deceleration was accompanied by an automated suggestion to place my feet on the ceiling, as the centrifugal gravity by that point was almost non-existent. When the doors opened, I was in as close to zero G as made no difference. The corridor had a visible curve, with doors and side corridors spaced regularly along it. The sign beside the elevator said, Utopia spoke. Handy. I just needed to move over to the other east-flowing river, the Nirvana. I picked a random direction and headed off. As with my first day, when we broke into Heaven's River, the Quinlan body had no trouble adapting to zero-G movement. Handholds along the corridor helped as well. Within a few minutes, I'd found the Nirvana spoke elevator. Small problem, the elevator was at ground level, so there would be a twenty-minute wait. The ride down was very much like the ride up in reverse. Strangely, starting from a view-from-orbit kind of panorama made it easier to get used to the height without cringing. By the time it started to resemble real land, I was verging on board. This maintenance complex was uninhabited, which led me to believe that most of the population of the mountains was probably resistance. I made it to the train station without incident and pressed my card against the reader plate. Not authorized, I looked up sharply. What? Your identification is not authorized. Oh, great. They'd canceled my card. Well, Natasha's card. It had been inevitable, but couldn't they have done it after I'd gotten on the train? I fished out the second card, the one I'd grabbed from the guard, and tried it. Not authorized. Well, that was that. I looked around, half expecting the entire population of hell to come pouring out, but this complex was uninhabited. Come to think of it, I'd never seen or heard of the administrator using anything but live muscle inside Heaven's River. Maybe automated muscle was forbidden. It sounded like the kind of limitation you'd place on an AI to keep it from taking over. And how had that worked out for the Quinlans? Still, while I wasn't about to be tackled, I also wasn't about to get a free ride back to Garrick's spine. 
and hordes of minions could be on their way right now. Their cards would work. A hasty departure seemed advisable. Back up the hallway, up the stairs, and soon I was in the lobby. The maintenance door opened easily from the inside, and I was out in the open. I could see a town in the distance, but I had no idea what it might be called. I was a quarter turn around the circumference of Heaven's River and 3,800 miles west of Garrick's Spine, which was my only way out. I had an eight-inch cube in my backpack, sticking up like a carbuncle and advertising my presence to any crew or resistance who might be looking for me. I might as well be wearing a hard hat with a flashing red light. Oh, and I couldn't risk going in the water. Piece of cake. I needed a story, some plausible reason for the big lump in my backpack. A quick glance up at the sun confirmed the day was young. I had plenty of time to get to the town before dark, but maybe I shouldn't. I had only the coins in my stomach, and I might need them for something more critical than lodging. I dithered for a few moments, then decided I might as well head for town while I tried to come up with something. First, I'd need to update Hugh. Hi, Hugh. Bob, got news? Of a sort. I have Bender. That's great. I'll meet you at Garrick's Spine, and we can get out of here. Ah, uh, it may not be that simple. I updated Hugh on recent events and my current location. Well, that's suboptimal, he said. Listen, you can't be the first Quinlan that's needed to carry something large. A funerary box is about the same size, for instance. Uh, what? Bridget can probably give you anthropological details, but Quinlins keep the bones of their deceased. Ground up, they fit into a box of about the right size. You'd accumulate a lot of boxes over time, I commented. Yeah, I don't know. Ask Bridget. But maybe check around town. Someone might have something that would keep the box dry. Maybe you can find a funerary box and test it out. That's an excellent idea, Hugh. Thanks. Then you just need to travel seven segments to Garrick, and you're golden. Thanks a bunch, Hugh. And with that cheery thought, I'm signing off. Still, one problem at a time. I paused and prairie dogged to get a close look at the town. Things might be looking up the slightest, teeniest bit. I composed and fired off an email to Bridget, not wanting to spare the cycles for a conversation. I'd review whatever she sent me when I had time. The first order of business, though, was to not come into town along the road from the maintenance complex. If someone was watching for a Quinlan with a carbuncle, that would be the obvious place to set up. Moving through the bushes was more of a pain than expected. I remembered Bridget mentioning that the climate varied from segment to segment, probably to replicate conditions on Quinn. This segment had a more tropical motif, which meant thicker and more riotous vegetation, and probably a lot more variety in the way of predators, and me without so much as a pig sticker in my inventory. After a half hour of bushwhacking, accompanied by my best cursing, I decided enough was enough. I spied a trail ahead that likely led to a regular road and made for it. The path led through some pretty run-down residential structures, and I began to worry about being mugged. A couple of rough-looking characters did give me the evil eye, but no one made a move. In fifteen minutes more, I was in the town proper, which was named Forest Hill. I buttonholed a few random strangers and eventually got directions to a funeral home. The Quinlan translation was more like House of Setting Sun, which was oddly poetic for a culture that named cities after people's body parts. I entered the establishment and glanced around. An elderly Quinlan came over to me. May I be of service? I, uh, I'm concerned about getting my grandfather waterlogged. I'm not sure exactly what might be available. Are you transporting your ancestor over a large distance? Yes, to Garrick's spine. I'm not familiar with that city. However, the normal strategy is to have the ancestor sent by post, carrying the box on your back. The sales critter ostentatiously leaned sideways to look disapprovingly at my backpack. I felt like I should blush or something. 
I'm hoping to bring him home myself. I'd like instead to find a way to wrap the box or get a better backpack. I left the sentence hanging, hoping the sales critter would volunteer something. He glanced at my backpack again, then asked, What size of funerary box? Um, Bender's matrix was eight inches on a side. Inside dimensions, eight and a quarter inches, I said, trusting the translation software to take care of the conversion to local units. That's oddly precise. Also not standard size. Here. He wrote something on a piece of paper and handed it to me. My cousin, Vinny, is a carpenter. He could probably put something together to your specifications. Tell him Carmine sent you. Of course, this wasn't a mass production society. Artisans would be easily available. I resisted the urge to smack myself and thanked Carmine profusely. I left the funeral home, chuckling at the software's choice of name equivalents. I'd have to ask Hugh if there'd been a little tweaking of the algorithms. Given what I'd done with Hugh's name equivalent, it was clearly Bob-like behavior. I read the note while wondering if I should ditch the backpack and cube while I worked. I could hide it in the forest, or I could get a room in a hotel. What would carry less risk? The forest would certainly be cheaper, but I couldn't bring myself to seriously consider tying Bender up in a tree and leaving him to the tender mercies of random chance. I did a quick calculation. I wasn't destitute yet, but I might end up working for passage on the way back to Garrick's spine. Meanwhile, keeping Bender safe was job one. I stopped at a general store and bought a few small items for three coppers total. I gave the proprietor an iron and received my change. I had a brief urge to swallow the coins right in front of her, but attracting attention was not a good idea. With a little searching around, I found a flea bag hotel and paid for a night. The kindest word I could find for the room was unimpressive. But it had a door lock, and the door felt solid, and the window was much too small for a Quinlan to get through, even if the room had been at ground level. And as was typical for Quinlan structures, the roof was exposed, support beams and all. I took out the length of rope that I'd purchased and did a quick leap and parkour to the rafters. It wouldn't be, strictly speaking, impossible for a Quinlan to duplicate that feat, but they would be more likely to just go get a ladder, which would hopefully take time. I tied the backpack with Bender in it to the highest point and shifted it around to be as invisible as possible from floor level. All good. I left my one remaining spider on the rafter as well, just in case. The Quinlan door locks were large and clunky compared to what I'd been used to on Earth, but the mechanism was nevertheless fairly sophisticated. Again, I was reminded that the Quinlan's technology was limited, not their knowledge. I spit up a few coins to carry with me, locked the door behind me, and sent in a couple of fleas to freeze the lock mechanism. I was probably being overly paranoid, but the downside of overdoing it was much less bad than the downside of under-preparing. First stop was a backpack shop. On Earth, that would have been a sports store, but with Quinlan's backpacks were simply apparel. A few quick inquiries on the street, and I had a destination. The shop was definitely upscale, not as in gold trim, but as in high quality and good selection. They carried backpacks, sashes, kits for fur decoration, and other items that the sophisticated and stylish Quinlan couldn't live without. I just hoped the backpacks were more than fashion statements. I approached the single sales critter. I'm looking for a new backpack. My old one popped a seam because I've been carrying a funerary box in it. Do you have something with good capacity and dependable waterproofing? As it happens, we do. You shouldn't, of course, spend a lot of time in water, but it'll hold for the occasional fishing expedition. He led me over to a display and gestured. Only five irons for this model. Eep. That would take most of my remaining cash. I opened my hand and looked down at the four irons I'd coughed up, 
trying to project disappointment, piteousness, and whatever else I could manage. He glanced at the coins in my hand and sighed. I can't do four, my friend. Four and a half, and it's yours. No problem, sir. I'll just hack, hack, hack. No, not really. The urge was almost overpowering, but even ignoring not wanting to attract attention, I was sure he'd throw me out. I'll, uh, talk to my friends back in a while. I left the shop and went looking for Vinny's place. On the way, I surreptitiously coughed up some more coins. Vinny's place had a sign over the door that said, Vinny's place. Really, Quinlan's sucked with names. The window showed some of his products, including funerary boxes, small furniture, and some carved items. He did good work. Are you Vinny? I said to the lone occupant as I walked in. I am. May I help you? Carmine sent me here. I'm looking for a specific size of funerary box. He thought you might be able to help me. Vinny's face lit up, and I realized that Carmine must actually be a relative and well-liked. I hoped that would help my cause. We spent a few minutes talking about my requirements. It's an odd size and oddly specific, he said. I'm trying to protect my existing box, I explained. My grandfather died a long way from our family home. I have to bring him back there, and I can't afford the obvious methods. I admire your dedication, young sir. I can produce such an item. It will take about three days and will cost six irons. However, I can't guarantee that it will be watertight. That simply isn't normally part of my requirements. Well, between the room, the backpack, and the box, I'd be wiped out, and I would still have to pay for passage. And I didn't have any choice about going by boat. While the Manny would probably survive a seven-segment swim, I very much doubted that Bender would arrive still dry. Like it or not, I was going to have to play tourist. Or deckhand. But I had no choice in the end. We talked some more, and I considered trying to haggle him down, but the simple lack of waterproofing rendered it moot. In the end, I thanked him for his time and told him I'd think about it. I was heading back to the backpack store when I received an alert from the spider in my room. Someone seemed to be trying to unlock the door, and they were being increasingly unsubtle about it. The fleas had rigged the lock well enough that the interlopers would have to break down the door to get in. Would they go that far? Would anyone notice or investigate? It wasn't a high-class neighborhood, but the proprietor might object to costly damage in a room that would be unrentable for a while. And the would-be home invaders agreed. After a few more rattles, the sounds of assault stopped. I had no illusions that that was the end of it. It appeared none of my plans for the day were going to succeed. I changed direction and picked up speed, not quite breaking into a run. As I moved, I stretched my features and changed my fur patterns back into Natasha's face. That might get me in the door without being observed. The door to my room was still intact, although the lock and knob was a little more scarred than I remembered. No one appeared to be hanging around. I didn't kid myself, though. There would be surveillance. Whether they were looking for Bob or Natasha or both was an unknown. Whether it was crew, resistance, or both was pretty much irrelevant at this point. My fate at the hands of either party, and more important, Bender's fate was a foregone conclusion. I glanced at the window speculatively as I was climbing up to my pack. No such luck. What had originally seemed like a security feature was now a trap. There was only one way out of this room. But not necessarily so for the building. They'd be watching the front and back doors, but maybe there was a third alternative. I collected my spider and fleas, then locked and re-jammed the door. The scam probably wouldn't distract my pursuers for long, but every little bit helped. Meanwhile, I needed to be out of here. I headed for one of the two second-floor bathrooms for some privacy and a chance to think. How to get out undetected. I couldn't just go downstairs and peek out the front door without attracting attention. 
I had accepted it as a given that someone was watching the front, probably the back as well, and there were only the two doors. From the bathroom window, I could see the alley where one of the pub staff was tossing something into the dumpster. I snorted. Dumpsters. Another parallel. Wait. What other parallels were there? Food deliveries. Garbage pickup. Even a dump like this needed services supplied by other companies. I took a quick glance out into the hallway. No one. I made my way to the back of the building where presumably the kitchen and the storage areas would be. On the way, I passed a cleaning person with a cart. The cart included a garbage can of sorts made of wood. No trash bags here. The cleaner was working on one of the rooms, so I grabbed the can off the cart. As I continued down, I placed my backpack in the can, then hoisted it up so the contents weren't visible. I got a glance or two as I passed through the service area, but who's going to question someone who's obviously working? Chances were the hired help around here was transient and part-time anyway. I made it out to the back, holding the can up so it obscured my face and making a show of struggling with the weight. The dumpster was up against a fence, something I'd noticed from the bathroom. What wasn't discernible was whether the fence would collapse the moment I put my weight on it, but it didn't matter. I was committed. I swung the can around, still projecting, This is really heavy, y'all, with every pour, and upended it onto the edge of the dumpster. As I tipped it, I grabbed the backpack before it could drop into the bin. I pulled the can back with one hand, put it upside down on the ground as quietly and quickly as possible, and used it to vault over the fence. There was a shout behind me, and I could hear running feet, but I was already on the other side and out of sight. I had perhaps two seconds to get out of view of someone coming over the fence. A quick glance said that west was the shorter sprint to cover. I went east. As I turned into another alley, I heard the thump of someone landing, and a curse. Did I mention that Quinlan's weren't particularly acrobatic? Smiling to myself, I imagined a couple of sprained ankles. That would slow them down. Meanwhile, though best make tracks, I dodged and wove through alleyways and quieter streets, avoiding any area with too many potential witnesses. Within minutes, I was at the edge of town. Without breaking stride, I headed for the forest. Sleeping in a tree. Not a phrase a Quinlan was likely to use, which made it ideal for me. I found a particularly large, heavily foliaged specimen and set myself high up in the thicker parts. I spit out my spider for sentry duty, clamped my arms around the trunk, and ordered the AMI to stay put. Everything seemed stable for the moment, so I exited the Manny and popped into my VR. Hugh, I'm in vert if you feel like popping over. Sorry, Bob. Stacking cargo. I'll try to get away later, though. Hmm. Honestly, I wasn't sure what I would say to him anyway. Did I want to confront Hugh about the administrator thing? What would I accuse him of, exactly? I didn't even know for sure that he was aware the administrator was an AI, and if he did... Say he admitted to suspecting it. What law or rule exactly had he broken? My suspicions were second order, I realized. Suspicions of suspicions. I would have to keep a lid on it until I figured out what, if any, nefarious motives Hugh or the Skippies might have. I tried connecting to Gandalf, but got an auto-reply. Probably Gandalf was fighting orcs or something. Quickly, I checked Bill, Will, Bridget, and Howard and got either busy signals or auto-replies. It appeared everyone in the Bobiverse was a little tied up at the moment. With a bad-tempered grumble, I called up a coffee and activated Spike. So, item. I had seven segments to traverse, and it would have to be mostly by boat. Come to think of it, even if I trusted the Quinlan postal system to deliver Bender safely, it wouldn't be any faster. The mail traveled by boat. Item next. I still had to get out of Heaven's River once I got to Garrick's spine. In principle, that shouldn't be an issue. We had the side entrance hatch that Gandalf had built. On the other hand, the locals were much more aware of us now, of me particularly, 
as Will's professor friend had rightly pointed out, I was probably going to show up on a lot of surveillance systems from now on. I could disguise myself, but I couldn't disguise the backpack. Or couldn't I? Granted, I had to watch my money, but my biggest hurdle right now was to get out of Forest Hill. Once I could lose myself in the vastness of Heaven's River, I might be okay. So, how to get out of town without exposing Bender's Matrix to view? Fifteen. Frustrations mount. Howard. July 2334, Trantor. Well, that tears it, I said. Humans are idiots. Bridget sighed. Given what's going on, Howard, I think they've shown considerable restraint in grandfathering us. Or they've noticed that we own half the damned city, and they'd lose a proxy fight. That may have played a part, I admit. Bridget walked to the picture window and gazed out, arms crossed. I enjoyed the panoramic view of the atmosphere of Big Top through the distant Fibrex dome of the city. The sight of clouds and Jovian life stretching off in all directions, seemingly to infinity, never failed to fill me with awe. But I knew that for Bridget it was about more than the view. It was a validation of her work and her professional reputation. She was the reigning expert on Jovian class life throughout human space and was unlikely to be dethroned any time soon. A passing pot of blimps brought a slight grin to her face. You have that smile, I said. Remembering our first encounter? Bridget laughed. Or the city's first encounter? She turned from the window. Howard, political issues come and go. But politics will be with us forever. We'll just outweigh them. Eventually people will calm down or forget, or we'll just wait until they're dead and a new generation is in charge. Meanwhile, we keep a relatively low profile. We'll be okay. We have forever, remember? The kids, the current batch are all adults. We'll have to hold off on new adoptions for a while. You said you needed a break anyway. Maybe it's time for another expedition. I have several candidate planets lined up, all with interesting-looking ecosystems. You've heard what Herschel and Neil are planning? Yes, but they have to get to Romulus, load up, then get out of human space. It could be as much as a hundred years before they reach the first new system, with no guarantees that it'll have anything worth exploring. And we can join up remotely, if and when. I want something a little more... Immediate. I nodded. Bridget was right. If it came down to it, we'd only be in trouble if the humans tried to confiscate our assets. And we had lawyers up the yin-yang for just that eventuality. We could literally keep the fight going in the courts longer than most of our opponents' lifetimes. All right, my love. You lead. Where do you want to go today? 16. Still trying. Bob, July 2334, Nirvana River System. I found myself surreptitiously reaching for my face again and consciously brought my arm back down. I had disguised myself once more, this time using a random passerby as my model. To avoid a twins issue, I'd tweaked the appearance a little. If I ran into my model, he might think he'd discovered a long-lost brother, but nothing more. After much soul-searching, I'd reluctantly left Bender tied up in the tree. No Quinlan was going to climb that high, not even with a gun pointed to their head. Wildlife tended to be small and not overly curious if something didn't smell like food. Bender was probably okay, but I was still terrified that something might happen and I'd have no way of ever finding him. But I had to make a clean break from Bob running around with Bender on his back to random guy going on a trip. And the best way to do that was to never allow anyone to see anything that would link us. So, Enoki Fun Guy, social gadfly and otter about town, was going to book a cruise on a local luxury vessel. Or 
more factually, I was going to try to work my way across seven segments disguised as random guy. But, and this was the good part, I would have luggage. I glanced up at the sign over my destination. Happy Al's Storage and Trunks. Well, that's not quite what it said, but metaphorically it wasn't far off. Quinlan's didn't go in for Samsonite luggage, but they did have occasional need for rigid boxes of the locking variety. Some of the items on display very much resembled old-fashioned steamer trunks, except without the metal strapping. That would have cost more than I was worth. But wood and leather could do a pretty good job, if worked properly. Happy Al, who, it turned out, went by the name of Steve, greeted me effusively as I walked in the door. I guess that business had been slow, and Steve was bored to the point of suicide. That could work for me. I'm looking for one of those, I pointed to a steamer trunk, about this size. I held my hands apart to illustrate. I wanted a trunk that would be bulky enough that someone couldn't grab it and run away, but small enough for me to carry. And with a security loop, like the one in the window. Steve straightened. Sir, all of our trunks have security loops and locks. We carry only the best stock. Um, on the one hand, that was good. On the other hand, it sounded expensive, but this part of my plan had very little wiggle room. Steve made for the back of the shop and returned in seconds with a trunk that was just about perfect. I gave it a brief once-over, including opening it to check the interior. This was as close to exactly right as I was going to get. How much? Eight irons, four coppers. Ouch. I let surprise show on my face and didn't move for a two count. That's, uh... Steve became chagrined, realizing he'd overreached. That is, of course, retail. However, it's a slow day, so... I took the hint. I have seven irons, six coppers. I opened my hand to show him. That's all I have in the world, and I do need this item. Steve looked briefly relieved, then managed to suppress it. Apparently, that was still above cost. That will be acceptable. I handed him the money and took the trunk. It was a good thing he hadn't dug in his heels. I might have spit up my remaining two irons just to see his expression. The trunk had a nice lock on it, made of whatever insanely hard wood they used instead of metal. It could probably be forced by a determined thief, but the point was to not attract the attention of thieves in the first place. To that end, as soon as I was back to my tree, I started rubbing dirt on it to take the shine off. A few minutes' attention got me a suitably grubby and time-worn trunk. Next, I harvested some dry grasses for cushioning and lined the inside. When the preparations were all done, I climbed the tree and retrieved Bender. I removed the matrix from my much-maligned backpack then placed it carefully in the trunk, making sure the organics were packed densely enough to not shift. I spit out my one remaining spider and put it in the trunk with the matrix. The spider was my insurance policy. It would make some modifications to the trunk to make it harder to open, or steal, and if worse came to worse, some thief was going to get a face full of plasma cutter. The backpack wasn't looking good. The cube had stretched it, and... I couldn't be sure that it would spring back into normal shape. If not, I would stand out, even without the matrix. I sighed, shook the backpack a few times, then put it on. I'd stand out more without one at all. One last item to take care of. Hugh, you got a sec? Sure, what's up? I'm about to apply to be a deckhand. Anything I need to know? Is there a guild or union? No, not like what you mean. There's a guild, but it's mostly just for arbitration and setting rates, and you're in it automatically if you work on a ship. So there isn't a problem with treatment of laborers? These are Quinlans, Bob. They can live off the land. If someone started beating the deckhands, they'd just all swim away. If they didn't outright disembowel the miscreant. Have you met Quinlans? Hmm, fair point. So they're cantankerous, mobile, can find food anywhere, and can sleep anywhere. Uh-huh. Kind of hard to develop an oppressed underclass in those circumstances. What's the pay? A half iron per day. If someone tries to offer you below that, snarl and walk away. Gotcha. Thanks. That was better than expected. 
Hugh had gotten a job right away, so I hadn't really expected a problem. But any Bob would tell you that Murphy was a bitch. I arrived at the riverfront, trunk slung over my shoulder, and headed for the docks. There were several boats tied up, but only one had any activity. Some pallets were being unloaded, and there was also some cargo waiting to be brought on board. It looked like my best bet, if only because the other two boats appeared to be deserted. Still, I examined the two deserted vessels, frowning. They weren't empty. There were some palleted boxes and bales, but it was odd that no one was about. However, Quinlan deckhands were swarming over the third boat, practically sprinting from job to job. I noted in passing that they weren't wearing the almost ubiquitous Quinlan backpacks, although one Quinlan who was standing around screaming orders in invective in almost equal amounts was wearing what appeared to be a vest with pockets. The Quinlan with the vest paused and spoke to me, guessing what was on my mind. Part of the shipment's late. We got lucky. We were here first and signed for what was waiting. You looking for work? I am. You hiring? She gestured at the boxes on the dock. That pig isn't going to load itself, although the lazy sots I already pay for no reason seem to be hoping it will. The Quinlans unloading the boat replied with pro forma insults and one Quinlan middle finger equivalent. It seemed good natured, though. Say the word and I'll start hauling. You got it? Get to work. Well, that was easier than I had any right to expect. There was no need to ask where they were going. Boats almost always went downstream, unless they were very local, and on this river segment, downstream was east, toward the Garrick's spine segment. Can I drop off my trunk? She gestured to a corner of the boat, attention already on the next problem. I dropped off the trunk, and after a moment's thought, took off my backpack as well. Being a deckhand on a Quinlan boat was very much a strong-back, weak mind kind of thing. Pick up box here, put box down there. Rinse, repeat. My manny was much stronger than a native, and I didn't get tired, but overheating could be an issue, so I didn't push it. Every once in a while, the entire crew would take a fiver in the water to cool off, which told me I wasn't the only one with that problem. The work was accomplished with the minimum of conversation, We'd keep working until all the cargo was moved, so malingering of any kind was pointless. Everyone just wanted to get it done. When the last box had been loaded, we parked our butts on the edge of the boat while the Quinlan in the vest, who turned out to be the captain, argued over the paperwork with the dockmaster. Welcome to the hurricane, one of the deckhands said. I'm Auric, this is Ted, and this is Frida. I was momentarily taken aback and looked closely at Frida. No, definitely not the same person. Same Quinlan name, though, which the translation software converted to the same English name. Enoki, I replied. Enoki fun guy. Oric looked mildly surprised. Uh, family name, and you're deckhanding. We are an old family, I told him, but we were never wealthy. My mother always told me, we've earned that name and you'll damned well use it. Yes, Mom. That got chuckles, but I wasn't sure if my momentary flippancy hadn't set me up for trouble. I'd forgotten that family names were little short of hereditary titles in Quinlan society. Had I just painted myself as a target? Well, I'd have to roll with it. We also have a paying passenger, Ted volunteered. He's off shopping. Captain Lisa told him to be back before midday or he would have to find another ride. He's cutting it pretty close. He also has a last name, Frida added, as he reminds us constantly. I've come close to opening his throat a couple of times, but the captain says we have to be polite to the paying passengers. She made a face to indicate her opinion of the command. Captain Lisa finished haranguing the dockmaster and the two exchanged signatures. She marched up the ramp and glared around. His Highness not here? Oh, well. He paid in advance. Let's haul ass, people. We need to hit Melon Patch by nightfall. We jumped up and started releasing lines and pulling up boarding ramps. There wasn't much to it, but I made a point of taking orders from the others without complaint or trying to improvise. Just as we were at the point of pushing away from the dock and raising sail, a fat Quinlan came puffing, yelling, and waving one arm. 
The other arm was holding onto a trunk, not unlike mine, except much newer looking. Quinlans were fat by nature, resembling beavers more than otters in that respect, but this individual was fat even by Quinlan standards, and out of shape to judge from the panting and gasping. The captain growled under her breath but motioned us to lower one gangplank. The Quinlan put his trunk down and trudged up the ramp, still trying to catch his breath. As he passed the captain, I heard him say, Have someone retrieve the trunk, please. The captain gave him a sour look but motioned to me. I had a strong urge to accidentally drop it into the water, but I was in a uniquely bad position to get into a game of tit for tat, so I played it straight bringing the trunk on board and depositing it with the other miscellaneous items, including my trunk. But I gave the translation software specific instructions for converting his name. So, who is he? I asked Ted. Snidely Whiplash. His family is big in the wine business, as near as I can tell. He's just an entitled whelp, though. The beverage wasn't exactly wine, but it was the result of fermenting some local fruit. And as with most alcohol, it was big business. I was no stranger to snot-nosed kids who thought their parents' success made them a big deal. This voyage might end up being more difficult than anticipated. With our passenger safely, if obnoxiously, aboard, we cast off. Ted and Frida pulled up the sail, and we wallowed majestically out of port. The hurricane was basically a barge with a sail, and it had all the racing feel appropriate to the design. I began to wonder if we'd make it to the end of the segment. Speaking of which, hey, Oric, does the hurricane jump segments? If we've got the cargo to justify it, otherwise we circle into the Arcadia River and head back to the other end. Lease is not one of these big-time operations with a set route. If you were to get on the Galway... They never leave this segment, just up and down each river circling the world. It's not a terrible life. If you want to head into the next segment, you can get off at high peak. There will usually be a boat going through within a day or two. The Hamilton jumps segments. I think they'll go three or four segments sometimes. Again, though, depends on cargo. Have people around here ever named any of the segments? Oryx shook his head. It's bad luck. You name your segment, you start to identify with it, almost like a nation. Then you start to talk about borders and armies, and the next thing you know, you've been scattered as punishment. Frida, having finished with the sales, had joined the group. It's not punishment, it's... Yes, I've heard your doctrine before, Frida. It's not for us to judge the administrator. I'm not judging, Oric. I'm discussing their motivation, and it does make a difference. Punishments escalate. Guidance doesn't. We were interrupted by a snort from midships. You yokels and your legends about gods and demons, it is to laugh. Frida glared at Snidely, which didn't dent the supercilious expression on his face in the slightest. Legends? Are you defective? The administrator is as much a fact of life as the weather, or do you think rain is a myth, too? Sure he is. He makes the grass grow, lifts the little birds into the air, and makes the sun rise in the morning. I stared in disbelief. This buffoon apparently believed that Heaven's River was a natural environment. I opened my mouth to correct him, then was overcome by the sheer irony of the situation. I was about to explain to an atheist that God was real. I wanted to face Palm, but that would create questions. Best let the regulars take it. Oric and Frida formed an unsteady alliance, arguing against Snidely's amused intransigence. He was a classic case of Dunning-Kruger. So entrenched and confident in his ignorance that he didn't even realize how much he didn't know. I let the argument drone on in the background while I watched the shoreline drift by. As enjoyable as the days on the river with my friends had been, there was a lot to be said for the sailor lifestyle as well. The argument had escalated to the point where it attracted the captain's attention, though. Enough! she yelled. It's decks to be cleaned! 
The bilge needs pumping. The cargo still hasn't been tarped. And the spinnaker still hasn't been raised. Make yourselves useful. Well, that was that. And Snidely took this turn of events as a victory to judge from the pleased expression on his face. The next couple of days were uneventful. We got caught in a brief downpour, which elicited howls of complaint from Snidely. Why a creature that was designed for water should hate rain was beyond me, but... Then again, the family dog used to be on a first-name basis with every puddle and stream in our neighborhood, but would feign death when we tried to bathe her. Go figure. I continued to avoid interaction with Snidely. The other three seemed to be able to keep his attention. Oric and Frida had called a truce over their minor doctrinal differences in order to form common cause against the infidel. I was going to have to discuss this with Bridget. It seemed the administrator was taking on the aspects of a formal belief system, complete with competing dogma. Against that was a version of atheism that didn't so much pit science against religion as simply refuse to go along. I wondered what Snidely's cosmology would look like, but having to talk to him would be too high a price to pay to find out. We pulled into a town that Ted informed me was named Beetlejuice. No, I'm not kidding, nor did I tweak the translator. It turned out this town's major industry was a form of liquor made from the excretions of some insect. First, blah. second, it made me wonder, not for the first time, if there was some form of sense of humor involved, either from the skippies or from the software itself. I decided to let the translation stand and assigned it to the beverage as well. Beetlejuice was the last town on the Nirvana before the Segment Mountains. The captain would decide in the next day or two if we'd be continuing downriver or catching the transfer tributary to go back the other way. A lot would depend on what cargo we could get and where it would be the most valuable. It depended on paying passengers, too. If people were willing to pay to get to a particular destination, that would affect the captain's decision. Which made me wonder where Snidely was going. If we weren't going in the right direction for him, this would be goodbye. I tried to summon a tear and failed miserably. As we got closer, I could see that there was considerable activity at the docks, and it didn't seem to be all from the usual dock business. Four or five cargo ships were tied up while their crews had what appeared to be loud, bellicose discussions with official-looking individuals wearing sashes and swords. I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach. It seemed unlikely that this had anything to do with me, but by this point, any indication of cops made me as jumpy as a two-bit thief. Captain Lisa hopped around on deck yelling orders at us, trying to maneuver the hurricane into a tight space along the dock. This also involved a shouting match with the dock hands, which just added to the general holiday atmosphere. But eventually we were at dock and tied up properly. Ted and I grabbed the gangplank and started maneuvering it onto the dock. Before it had even settled, a delegation of cops marched up the plank. Captain Lisa moved to intercept them. We are searching for a fugitive who may be taking transport downriver, the sergeant said. We will need to inspect your ship. What? All our cargo? Are you kidding me? Do you have any idea how long it'll take? The sergeant shook his head. No, no. We're concerned about one specific individual carrying what appears to be a funerary box in his backpack. Uh-oh. Chances that there were two such fugitives on a billion-mile-long megastructure? Pretty low. I tensed and started planning escape routes before I remembered that I no longer resembled Bob, and I was not wearing a backpack at the moment. We will also need to inspect personal luggage. Oh, shit. You will like hell, Snidely exclaimed, striding up and sticking out his chest. And who might you be? The cop glared at him and put a hand on his sword. I am Snidely Whiplash of the Whiplash family. You've no doubt enjoyed our wine on many occasions. We can bring considerable pressure to bear if our family name is insulted. The cop was taken aback. 
no doubt dealing with powerful families, especially belligerent powerful families, was considerably above his pay grade. After a moment, the cop replied, Yes, sir. Understood. Obviously, you would not be a suspect in any case. Your luggage is where? Snidely casually waved a hand in the direction of the miscellaneous pile. See that it isn't touched. As I followed Snidely's hand wave, I got an idea. As casually as I could, I moved in the direction of the pile where our trunks were located. I began to untie the tarp covering the trunks and other small items. As I gathered it, I surreptitiously wiped off my trunk as much as I could. It still ended up looking more travel-worn than Snidely's, but not by much. A couple of cops came over, evidently pleased with my cooperation, and started looking over the pile. Those are Mr. Whiplash's trunks, I said, pointing to the two items. Everything else is just cargo. One of the cops nodded to me, and they began randomly opening boxes. How many people aboard? One said to me. Captain Lisa, Ted, Frida, Oric, myself, and Mr. Whiplash were all on deck. I pointed to each individual as I named them. None matches the description, the other cop said. And this is just junk, he added, waving at the boxes. I'm sure the captain would disagree, I replied with a small smile. The cops snorted and they moved back to the gangplank. One shook his head at the sergeant. A few seconds of discussion with Captain Lisa and the cops trooped away. Letting out a breath, I re-tarped the miscellaneous pile. As I straightened up after tying the last bite, I found Snidely gazing at me, a slight frown on his face. As casually as possible, I gave the tarp a tug and walked off to my next chore. But any attention from anyone was bound to be a bad thing. I would have to keep an eye on his bigness. As it turned out, we would be crossing segments. Two passengers signed on, wanting to go in that direction, and the captain was able to subcontract on a shipment to Orchard Hill, just on the other side of the mountains. Subcontracting wasn't as potentially profitable as hauling our own goods, but it was a no-risk payday, and a couple of paying passengers was just bonus. The passengers... A very old Quinlan and her granddaughter were heading back to the family home. Teresa was far too old to endure any kind of extended swim, so Belinda had swum upstream several hundred miles to take her home. Quinlan's had a strong reverence for the elderly, so the captain didn't balk at all when we set up a comfortable area in the sun for Teresa. Even Snidely didn't seem inclined to complain. Belinda doted on her grandmother, but wasn't otherwise talkative. She was friendly, but she would never use two words when a gesture or a grunt would do. On the few occasions that she did have to speak full sentences, she seemed to be almost out of practice. Remembering Bridget's comments about breeding away from tool user intelligence, I wondered if this might be a sign of that. Or maybe she just wasn't a talker. Once they were settled in, we went through the by-now routine frenetic running around that characterized leaving port. The cargo we'd taken on at Beetlejuice, which was mostly Beetlejuice, no surprise, was making the hurricane wallow a little more than usual, so we were taking extra care to maintain a good conservative trim. Once the boat was in mid-river and running in easy reach, we were able to break for lunch. I jumped in with the other crew members, and we chased down some juicy fish. Yum. Unfortunately, given the close quarters, I had to be seen to be eating, sleeping, and so on, just like everyone else. So, fish for breakfast, fish for lunch. When I was done with the Bender rescue, I resolved that I would never go near fish again. We brought up a dozen or so as well for the captain and passengers. I sat down with Teresa and Belinda, studiously ignoring Snidely, who was snarfing back fish like he hadn't been fed in weeks. The Pav would have approved of his table manners. My mother, not so much. Belinda quietly removed the less desirable fish parts with a small but doubtless expensive knife and offered the fillets to her grandmother, who took them with a smile. Belinda's not much for talking, Teresa said to me. I've watched you try to engage her in conversation. She placed a fond hand on her descendant's head. 
Kids are getting less and less verbal, it seems. I have a friend who commented that it's less necessary in Heaven's River, so intelligence is being gradually bred out. With some help from the administrator? I've heard that theory. Not impossible, but their manipulation would have to be very subtle. Oh, in Father's name, more yokel superstition, said Snidely. Save me from the uneducated. Teresa gave him a mild stare. And what's your educational background, Mr. Whiplash? I have a master's in business from the University of Peachland, he replied haughtily. I checked the translator out of curiosity. That wasn't bad, close enough to retain the meaning anyway, although I doubted that a master's had quite the same meaning as a human university degree. And you took classes at Peachland? Teresa asked. Of course. I taught courses at Peachland, Mr. Whiplash. Don't talk down to me. I have several doctorates in subjects much more relevant than how to count money for those who've had their life handed to them. <laughs> Whoa! Snidely jerked back, and I imagined flames sparking at the end of his whiskers. As much as I disliked him, obvious glee wouldn't be helpful, so I maintained a stone face as he stood stiffly. That would have been very handy. I suppose, before senility set in, he said, showing his canines. Belinda turned on him, snarled, and extended her claws. Snidely jumped back, surprised and alarmed by her reaction. You're a small man with a small, shriveled soul, Mr. Whiplash, Teresa said. There is no bigger waste than a formal education given to someone incapable of using it. I have no doubt your whole life would disappear into your father's accomplishments without leaving a ripple. Snidely glared at her for a moment, totally silenced, before stalking off. That went well, I said. Teresa chuckled. And what about you, Mr. Fun Guy? You have a last name as well. Do you have anything to show for it? Not really. My family earned the name long ago. Nowadays it's mostly useful for keeping people like Snidely from patronizing me too much. Do you believe, as Mr. Whiplash apparently does, that the world came about naturally? Of course not, I replied. It's a rotating structure, 100 hen in radius, composed of segments each 1,000 hen in length. The ratio is clearly artificial. The experiment to determine the rotational period is something we did in our first-year classes. It's exactly what you'd need in order to generate 0.86g. I was taking a chance showing any scientific chops, but I wanted Teresa to approve of me. Not just because she appeared to have a ferocious intellect, but... Also because I might learn something useful. This could turn out to be the first truly useful encounter since we'd landed. She nodded slowly. Ah, an engineer. A frustrating occupation, I imagine. So much of what you know you could do is forbidden. And what did you teach, Teresa? Philosophy. Math. History. She smiled sadly. That last item is particularly frustrating. Even in my lifetime, I've watched people letting go of some of the more difficult aspects of Quinlan history in favor of myth. Belief in the administrator as a supernatural deity of some kind and just-so stories. Jackpot. Maybe I'd finally get a complete picture of the history of Heaven's River. So... What do you think, the administrator? The captain's voice cut through everything. All right, you lazy sots. This tub won't steer itself. Are you going to leave that mess on the deck forever? Do I pay you to sun yourselves? Hop to it. Aside, lunch ten minutes was over. The next day's topic was life after death. Oric and Frida, no surprise, had opinions that tended toward the mystical. 
Teresa, bless her heart, didn't mock or condescend, but she did ask questions that they found very hard to handle. During a lull while Oric and Frida were regrouping, she turned to me. You've been quiet, Enoki. Don't have an opinion. I chuckled. That'll be the day. I guess the real problem is defining what you mean by life after death. I would have thought it was self-explanatory. The supernatural version, sure. Also unprovable, at least so far. But what? Are, 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 but, what are, but